Thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to join us today. My name is Brett Sion. I am the Director of Admissions and Financial Aid here at the J School. And you are tuned in today for a very informational session to learn about our Master of Arts program and everything that you can do with it. You'll see a lot of people on your screen today, both faculty members, and alumni of the program who are here to share their insights with you. So I know you'll, you'll get a lot of information as we go through. Um, we'll give you a little bit of introduction about, about the program and we will allow you to hear from everybody on your screen and ask some questions of your own. Um, and I'll tell you how that's gonna work as we go through. Just a couple quick housekeeping reminders. The session is being recorded and everybody should be on mute. So we ask you to stay on mute. And like I said, we, you will have time to answer, uh, to ask your questions and get those answered um, a little bit later. But one thing I do request is if you are able to turn on your cameras, please do so. We, many of us have, have been through so many of these meetings that we're tired of looking at little squares with names, names on them. So if you are able to turn on your camera and make this more of a participatory discussion, please do so. Again, my name is Brett Sion, and to quickly give you a, an introduction to the Master of Arts program, if, if you've looked at, at, our, at our programs on our website, or maybe looked at our brochure, or have met us at, at some events, you know we have a Master of Science program, and we have a Master of Arts program, um, a PhD program as well, but our Master of Arts program is very special. It allows journalists to come back to the journalism school take courses both inside and outside of the J School if they choose, to get a more nuanced, in-depth understanding of a particular subject area. So you may go back out into the field to report more knowledgeably, have a more in-depth, nuanced understanding, so you become the best storyteller that you can be. Um, and we have experts in this field to talk about the program, to talk about the various concentration areas and what you can do with it. So instead of me, taking a lot of the time to explain it. Let me introduce you to our first speaker, Jane Eisner, who is the Director of Academic Affairs. So Jane, I would just like to turn this over to you first and uh -huh. to give us a brief introduction to what is the Master of Arts program? Um, what do you see, I guess the first question is, what do you see in terms of experience for people coming in? Because I mentioned this is different than our Master of Science program, which is our foundational journalism training program for people perhaps with no or very little experience. But what do you see for people coming in who are interested in the Master of Arts program? How is that different? Well, thank you so much, Brett, and welcome to everyone. Um, this is a program for uh, people who are already journalists, who have the basic knowledge and experience to find, report, and tell a story, um, but are eager to become much, much smarter and more well-versed and proficient in one of three areas, arts and culture, business and economics, science and the environment, uh, or, and politics. And so what we see for this year's class are, and for the classes uh, ever since this program was created by our colleague Nick Lemon when he was dean, um, are people who really are passionate about one of these four subjects. Um, maybe you worked in a newsroom already for a couple of years, uh, or done some broadcasting, or done some really serious freelancing, and you've been kind of a generalist, and now you say, you know, I look at the world and I wanna write about climate change and I need to know this stuff. I need to be able to talk to the experts. I need to be able to explain complicated things to the public. And so I'm gonna to go to our program here, which has some of the best science journalists in the world um, and learn from them. So it's really a matter of going deeper in uh, into a subject matter. But I should also say, that there's an opportunity here to really broaden your journalistic skills. Uh, we have investigative reporting. We have a fantastic class called Evidence and Inference. And I um, know I'll talk about it in a moment, the opportunity to uh, write a long and ambitious piece of narrative nonfiction for your thesis. 
Yes, Jane, go ahead if you would talk about that, because in admissions, we often get the question, am I a better fit for the MS program or the MA program? So in just a couple of minutes, which is almost an impossible task, I understand that, but could you give us a little overview of the MA curriculum? And you mentioned the thesis and the, you know, the subject area courses that, that um, students can, can choose from. Um, if you could just kind of give us an overview of how this is maybe a little bit different in terms of the MA, or much different in terms of, of the MS and how the curriculum is laid out. Absolutely. We definitely do have the skills classes, investigative reporting and techniques uh, and evidence and inference that I mentioned. But really the three unique qualities of the MA program is that every student takes a seminar in discipline. It's twice a week, three hours sessions with the faculty that you see here on the screen. And it's um, a, a chance to really learn uh, about the subject very, very deeply. Um, second distinguishing characteristic is that MA students, unlike any other student at the journalism school, are able to take subject area courses throughout the university. Any graduate school is open. Um, international affairs, architecture, law, business, uh, and we encourage students to take classes that relate to their um, area of concentration. And the third distinguishing characteristic of our curriculum is the thesis. Um, it is much uh, longer and broader and more ambitious than an MS thesis. Um, students work directly one-on-one -on -one with advisors from the beginning of the first semester uh, through the end of April when the theses are due. There's a chance to do field reporting anywhere in the world over winter break, and we actually um, will subsidize that reporting uh, depending on the quality of the proposals. Um, and for most people who come to the MA program, even if they do have experience uh, writing and reporting routine stories, most have never had the chance to really grapple with an eight to 10,000 word thesis. And, um, and work one on one with a superb advisor to make something that very often um, becomes um, a great publishable piece and certainly will teach you all the basics of narrative nonfiction writing. We have workshops throughout the year that focus on different aspects of um, that to help students become proficient in that form of journalism. That's great, thank you very much. And I see a few other, some more folks have joined and most cameras are on, this is great. So for those of you who joined in the last few minutes, um, if you wanna put your camera on just so we could see your faces, this is a small group and, and the MA is a, is a small program. So we would love to, to start to get to know you. So if you can put your cameras on, if you haven't, um, please do so. Um, but I also want to introduce you to Nick Lemon, who's a Dean Emeritus and the creator of the Master of Arts program. Um, Nick, what year was the MA program started? Oh, and you're on mute, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> I think, hold on, let me, I'm gonna send you a message to unmute. Yeah, you just did. Am I uh, hearable now? You, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the first graduating class from the MA program was 2006. So, um, you know, using my math skills, we're getting close to 20 years worth of the of the program. Um, the impulse was, I mean, I'll just speak personally. I've uh, been a journalist for a really long time, so long that, you know, we're not giving exact numbers here. Um, and I, I felt in my career that, you know, I kind of step one was knowing how to basically write a story, you know, how to go out and interview people, how to write news clearly and quickly on deadline, get things right, et cetera. And once I'd done that, um, I started doing more and more ambitious work and I started feeling kind of out of my depth. I thought, you know, traditional journalism training has taught me how to get the facts and write them up cleanly and quickly. But when you ask me to deal with a really complicated, daunting subject, I feel kind of lost. Um, so, 
you know, the, who the MA program is for is people like the former me who want to get from where they are, you know, to point B where they're able to do much more ambitious and sophisticated work. Um, we felt that um, we were underutilizing um, the tremendous resource that being at Columbia University represents um, in, you know, the traditional life of the school. Uh, there was one much loved professor who would get up the first day of school and say, leave this university, you can learn nothing here, you can only learn on the streets of New York. And there's a lot of romance to that. Um, but we think you can learn on the streets of New York and you can learn in this university, which has experts on every conceivable subject. So one thing we've done in this program is build a, a dense web of ties to the rest of Columbia University. But in addition to that, um, you know, it. when I was young, people used to say, well, if you want to know how to write news, you know, go to a journalism program. And if you want to know how to understand a complicated subject, go get a degree in that subject. Um, the problem with that is you're taking academic courses and writing academic term papers, and it's very useful to sort of take in that material and then map it back onto journalism practice in real time with mentorship. And that's what we do in the MA program. So we don't just send you, we don't just have the journalism is in this building, the substance is outside this building. We marry them in this building, in our classes, in the work you do. So the work you do in the program is distinctively journalistic and, and you know, particularly the thesis, which almost always is the most ambitious uh, work of journalism the student has ever done and, you know, very often gets prominently published and so on. Um, that's the ultimate proof of concept of what we're trying to do here. Thank you so much, Nick. And you'll hear from uh, Nick in a couple of minutes when we get to the politics concentration specifically. So let's jump in. Uh, you heard a quick introduction to the four concentration areas within the MA program. So let's let you hear from additional faculty and alumni from each of them. And you also get to meet some other admissions staff along the way. So first, let's go over to my colleague, Ross Yelsey, who will introduce you to the arts and culture concentration. Ross. Thanks, Brett. Uh, and it's really a great thing to start with arts and culture because I'm actually an alumnus of that particular concentration. So it's fun to, to roll, roll our discussion out with that one. And I'd like to welcome our professor, David Haydu, who is a member of the faculty in the arts and culture concentration, as well as Rosalind Colgan, who is a 2022 graduate of the program. And I thought I'd start uh, with a question for David. David, could you talk a little bit? I know we can't get into great depth. We could talk all day about each concentration, I'm sure. But could you tell us a little bit about how students in the arts and culture concentration um, develop stronger critical and reporting skills in the arts and culture beat? And maybe what are some of the trajectories some of our graduates have gone on since being in the program? Sure. Well, one of the key things that we, we do uh, is gear ourselves to treat the arts with more in more context with more perspective and i mean uh historical context in part so that we could see how art arts of the past inform the subsequent movements in the arts and how arts contest or challenge the art movements that preceded them uh, cultural context so we could see how uh, a movement in the, in the arts uh, is both informed by the larger culture and maybe incites change in attitudes and modes of thought and behavior in the larger culture and in contemporary context. So we could see how the arts fit in to social and the social and political landscape of the moment. And the program, that's very ambitious, but we do all that. And it's a very rangy, wide ranging program. Another thing we, we aim to do, broadly speaking, is aim to improve our powers of analytical thinking, which we then apply to our reporting. So we open the term with a few sessions on the nature and the character of art, like what big questions about what is art. 
we wrestle with these big questions and we do we read some you know, challenging readings uh, and then we make art ourselves for a day uh, and we could learn from both of those processes and we see how they fit. Uh, we take up a range of issues over the two terms of the, of the term. We cover how the art marketplace works, uh, arts and culture and government policy, uh, intellectual property law, AI and technology and art. It's very, very, we have a very like holistic uh, view of the arts. I'll give you a quick idea of what the assignments are. We start by having the students cover an avant-garde arts festival that it begins literally the week, the first week of the term called Crossing the Line. And the students, you know, we go out and cover this very challenging complex art and with an aim to having those pieces published in a very high level journal, online journal called Hyperallergic. And if you know, while you're you know, at your computers, you can look up hyperallergic, you could see the pieces that the students have been doing this term over the last several weeks. Our current class uh, going out, covering this arts festival and reporting it and having the pieces published in a high level, like all in real time. Uh, after this, the students will do a long form profile of a creative artist still in the fall. And they'll wrap up the fall term by doing a podcast, an audio project in teams. In the spring, uh, taught by my colleague, Elisa Solomon, uh, the students will do a long form work of cultural criticism and then an investigative project. So it's a very ambitious program. It's a program that I wish I had taken. I wish that existed when I was a, you know, a young arts journalist and trying to figure everything out. It would have saved me uh, 15 years of grief and a couple dozen rejection letters and, and, and just as many em, embarrassments. So I, I wish the program existed when I were younger. I'll, I'll give you a quick taste. I, I made a list of where some of our current students are. You'll meet one in a moment, Rosalind Colgan from last year's class, who is now at time out. A, a, literally a brief taste of some others. Uh, Chris Ipp is the culture editor at The Atlantic. Casey Iani is at Fast Company. Gabrielle Bruni is at Jezebel. Bao Ong is at the Houston Chronicle. Caleb Pershing is at the San Francisco Chronicle. Abigail Covington is at Esquire. Sam Block is writing a book for Random House. Curtis Wong is at Huffington Post. Blah, 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 blah. So uh, we... I'm looking forward to engaging with those of you who are interested in the program, and I'll be here and be, I'll be also be happy to talk to you after this session. Thank you, David. And yes, Rosalind, as David said, uh, you're working now at Time Out. Maybe you can tell us a bit about your job there and what things you learned in the arts and cultural concentration that have been the most valuable to you. Yes, absolutely. Glad to be here, everyone. Um, as Jane said, I really fit the profile of a student uh, joining the MA program. I had some news experience and over the years realized that I wanted to specialize in arts and culture and this program helped me to do that and really helped to accelerate my career. So right out of Columbia, I was freelancing for publications like Atlas Obscura, Hyperallergic, Sever Magazine, and then after a few months of applying, I landed what I think is the coolest job in New York. So I feel very lucky about that. I am things to do editor at Time Out New York, where I'm covering uh, things, anything things to do, which is a very broad topic. So that could be anything from comedy to music, performing arts, visual arts, you name it, um, which has been a blast. And I I think the work of the MA program uh, has helped me every single day, both in terms of exposure to the arts as well as writing. So I'll give you two key points. The first is that exposure to the arts. I am confident entering any situation with knowledge of the discipline and with knowledge, as David said, of kind of the historical perspective. I had no idea in the arts and culture program that Martha Graham's less, uh, dance lessons were going to be so important in my work, as well as John Cage, uh, John Cage's music, which, believe it or not, both of these uh, artists have come up multiple times in my time at Time Out so far. Um, and also we uh, took a, another assignment we did was take a gallery tour and write about that experience. That's something that I do all the time. So being able to have that confidence to go into any space 
and feel that I have some, some history and some knowledge and I'm able to ask insightful questions is so helpful. And then the second thing I'll mention in addition to that is the writing and interviewing skills that I honed throughout the program. Um, as you heard, we went through uh, several assignments and we got some really detailed feedback from, from our professors throughout the year. And I bring that into my thought process every time I'm writing, whether it's a headline, whether I'm thinking about paragraph structure. So that is something that I apply in my work every day. And I certainly am uh, have accelerated my career through the program. Thank you, Rosalind. And I think we'll have some chances later on to do some Q&A with everyone uh, about some other, other parts of the program. So we'll move on for now uh, from arts and culture to business and economics. And I'll be chatting also now with Professor Winnie O'Kelly, uh, Dean of, um, the, yes, Dean of Academic Affairs at Columbia Journalism School and a professor in that concentration, and Olivia Carville, a 2018 graduate of the MA Business and Economics concentration. And starting with Winnie, Winnie, what are some of your goals for what you want students to get out of the MA Business concentration um, in terms of the skills and things they're going to be able to do when they finish the program? You know, in the simplest of terms, you want to be able to follow the money right? Isn't that what we all want to be able to do, whatever your beat is and however it, however it comes together? The skills you'll pick up are very similar in structure to the ones that David talked about. We want you to be able to tackle the really big questions of the day. Right now, those include things, excuse me, I'm very hoarse today, <clears throat> things like what should the government response be to things like a pandemic? What kind of fiscal response should the government have? We've looked at that around the world and in the United States in my class recently. Um, what should Fed policy be for inflation? Another thing that is just gripping all of our lives every single day. You probably want to write or think about things like inequality, which we spend a, a unit on in this class. So those are the kinds of topics that we grapple with, really big, meaty ones. And then we try to go down on how you write stories in those areas and how you come up with the ideas for them. So my students are pitching off of each of the sort of the modules that we talk on a regular basis. And then a certain number of those they execute as complete stories before the semester is over. And to me, one of the most important things about this concentration is it gives you the underpinning for whatever you want to cover. And I say that because I've had the experience of so many people saying, I'm not sure what I want to do, but I want to be able to cover what I do better. You don't need business or economics experience if you're going to come into this. I tell, people ask me that all the time. It, you do need to be a journalist, but we'll help you. If it's something you want to know how to do better, we're going to help you try to figure out how to get there. So that'll include, you know, if you want to become a better news writer, if you want to become a better beat reporter and understand how to cover business or the economy, depending on where your particular interests lie, or if you want to be more of a narrative writer or do investigative work in this space, you need to have that sort of overarching frame. And there's a good chance you didn't study economics or business intensively undergrad. I know I didn't. So like some others who've come before me, I'll say, I wish I'd had this program. I spent decades teaching myself, learning from others. And I think this is a way to jumpstart your career very quickly into an area where there's extraordinary demand right now. I mean, people are looking for business journalists. They're looking for these kinds of skills and I wanna help people get them. Great, thanks, Winnie. And Olivia, I know you're working at uh, Bloomberg, and I know you recently won the Vert Prize and several other recognitions for an investigation you did about Airbnb. Could you tell us a little bit about that story and then also about some of the skills that you developed in the MA Business Concentration to uh, apply to your work? Yeah, sure, and it's great to be here. I'm so excited for the prospective students who are signing on today because Columbia really did change my life. Um, I wrote a story last year about Airbnb. I was looking into the ways in which the company will spend a lot of money trying to keep violent crime that occurs inside its listings in the shadows. I uncovered one case where the company spent $7 million in a private settlement payout to a woman who was raped inside an Airbnb listing in New York City. And I was trying to get to the bottom of you know, the company's strategy around how they approach violent crime and what they do internally to try and keep it quiet. There is no way I would have been able to do that story had I not gone to Columbia. As you've heard, I, um, like when he was saying, had zero experience as a business reporter or an economics reporter. To be quite frank, I was afraid of business reporting when I started out. I avoided it like the plague. What I wanted to do was write about people. I wasn't interested in writing about money when I was a junior reporter. Um, the business desk was uh, not an area that interested me. And it wasn't until I was in my late 20s 
on a reporting trip um, across rural China that I realized the mistake I'd made in doing that. You know, I think that as journalists who like to focus on social justice or human rights related stories, what we're doing is writing about suffering and exploitation. But what we're not doing is writing, you know, about why it's happening, writing about who stands to benefit. And that's what I realized. Um, I realized that I could write a story about the suffering of people, but I couldn't write the real story, the one about, you know, what was going on behind the scenes, the one about the, the industry and how regula um, unregulated it was, and I couldn't follow the money. And so I applied to Columbia to try and sew up the holes in my resume. I wanted to learn how to do that. And I didn't have the ability to do that myself. As a social justice reporter, when I tried to do business reporting, it was an epic fail. My stories were you know, pretty, pretty weak and um, I would be steamrolled in interviews with chief executives. I didn't know how to hold my own ground. And so what I learned at Columbia, it's not so much the technicalities of business, it's more the foundational knowledge, the ability to walk into an interview and feel confident in my ability to actually ask the right questions, to know how to find the story. And prior to, to being at Columbia, I just didn't know how to do that. And so I, I use what I learned at Columbia on a daily basis. I'm now on the investigations team at Bloomberg. And while I'm aware of my shortcomings as a journalist, I know that I may never truly understand what decentralized finance is. But what I do have the ability to do is, is ask the right questions as they pertain to business journalism and get to the bottom of the story. I know how to find the money now. Great, thank you so much. Um, and now we'll move on to the politics concentration. I'd like to introduce uh, Taryn Almanzar, the Associate Dean of Admission and Financial Aid. Hi, Taryn. Hi, Ross. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, from wherever it is you may be joining us. I see a couple of faces and names that I'm starting to recognize. And I know that you are literally joining us from all over the world. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, so let's continue on with our webinar. I have the pleasure now of speaking to um, Alexandra Stilla, Nicholas Lemon, and Atul Dev, all who are within the politics concentration. Um, question four, let's start with Nicholas and, um, and Alexander. So we've all heard about how the concentrations help the students and the graduates move along their careers. Can we touch a little bit about what is the difference, right, of a journalist that is covering politics without the MA degree and someone who is covering politics with the Masters of Arts in politics? Like, what are, what are the fine differences between those two journalists and what are the main differences that they may find themselves when they're out there in the field? Um, well, um, I would say that one important difference is that um, a kind of foundational belief in traditional journalism is that you're only as good as your sources, and it's very source-centered. Um, and what I think we try to teach in the MA program is that you can build up knowledge of your own in an area of specialization that means that you're not simply being led around by the nose by your sources. And you know, as Olivia was saying, how to push back in an interview, how to come to an interview with substantive um, knowledge that, that allows you to uh, go beyond simply what, people, what other people tell you. Um, I would say that um, there are other things about it that uh, I think um, take you to another level. I think the, um, um, the program works especially well, as we said, for people who already have been working for a period of years. And I think a lot of people reach a point in their career where they're frustrated from the feeling that I feel like I've written the same story several times and um, I don't know why, and I can't figure out how to do a better job at it, but I don't have time to do it because I have a deadline tomorrow. Um, and I think this program allows people to step back and to immerse themselves in 
um, um, in scholarship and research in areas that interest them. So they actually see familiar problems in unfamiliar ways. Uh, we bring in experts in from a variety of fields, in the case of politics, political science, sociology, law, and economics, that I think helps our students do work of greater complexity and depth. Yesterday, for example, in class, we had a political scientist who uh, has written a book about populism that helped us see both what the common denominators and the underlying forces that have produced um, political figures such as Trump, Bolsonaro, Orban, Erdogan, Narendra Modi. Um, we look at things like nationalism and eth ethnic conflict, which exist everywhere. Um, but when you talk to ordinary people about um, national conflict, they will tell you that um, their group has uh, been in war with this other group forever. But it's important to understand that nationalism, uh, this idea that you should be willing to die or kill for something called the nation is actually a quite recent historical phenomenon. And understanding that helps you decode and report better on the actual stories you may be uh, writing about. At the same time, as Nick had mentioned, um, this is, of course, it's customized for we have all this um, uh, research and scholarship that we immerse our students in, but it's customized for journalists and all the writing that we do in the program is journalism. Um, in the fall seminar I teach, I have students do three drafts of every story um, so that we can pay very close attention to writing and revision. Um, I think something that is hard to get in the workplace now is that kind of close attention feedback and opportunity to revise and really make your work better. Um, I think that the stories that stand out in today's world um, are ones that provide a, a really interesting and original conceptual take, uh, just reporting the news in the world of 24 seven social media coverage is no longer adequate. And so I think the program gives students the opportunity to take stories of greater length and ambition um, and gives them the supervision they need to help them succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. That was um, extremely helpful. A tool. can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing before um, you attended the J school, what kind of skill sets you learned while in the MA program and how that has helped you move along in your career path? Right. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, your yeah. audience. <laughs> uh, right. Thank you, Darin. Uh, lovely to speak to you, all of you here. I was, uh, I was working in India for about eight years as a journalist, as a magazine journalist before I came to the journalism school. And as to sort of <laughs> the ways in which it helps sort of, I'll have to repeat what everyone has said already, but as, as David said, as Olivia said, it is a lot about contextualized. And what Professor Steele was just saying, uh, you know, right now is that you really start thinking about the concepts of the world as sort of like, it's it's not just about one politician who's sort of running the country to the ground. And that generally is the sort of story all of us have tired of, you know, writing by the time we come to the school after five or six years of working somewhere. This sort of, you know, allows you to think about the nation as a concept about you know these ideas that in the last two three hundred years the whole world has been playing with and the kind of sort of political strains that it has you know come down to and and thinking about that is is really helpful in a way because because you do not get bogged down in details and your sort of perspective becomes rather global because you're not looking at one country. You have experts coming over who have, you know, worked in Turkey, who have worked in Algeria, who have worked in Italy and, you know, several other countries in Latin America and, uh, you know, the, uh, the South Asia. So all of this sort of allows you to become a better journalist and also to become a better thinker where you can sort of tackle with ideas that it's not just about sources it's all, it, it is also about like a body of work and you can uh, you can talk to experts while being a bit more educated about these things you don't have to take anybody's words because you know this is this is something that you have covered in your class so that is very helpful 
And another thing that I would just like to say is that, of course, this is a pro program that is designed for journalists and uh, all the assignments that we do are journalistic in nature. But as Nick was saying that there was that professor who used to say on the first day of school that, you know, there's nothing you're going to learn in school and whatever you learn will be on the streets of New York. I mean, the streets of New York are right here. <laughs> So they're very much accessible. So both could be done. And I think that also is a great thing about Colombia is that it's in a city as opposed to, you know, outside of it. And it's a media center and there are a lot of stories and the subways and the trains and everything. And there will be a chance to report all of those for, you know, the brilliant professors that we have. Thank you, Atul. Thank you for that. Um, I will like to turn it over now to my colleague, David Hooker. David, over to you. Right. Thank you, Taryn. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this webinar today. Um, I'm going to introduce our um, science concentration. Um, we have with us today Professor Marguerite Holloway. And we also have Janelle Redka, who is a graduate of the class of 2022. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, I think I'll start the conversation with uh, Marguerite. If you could give us a few examples of, you know, sort of like the ways that the MA Science Seminar helps students become um, more knowledgeable um, and confident uh, science journalists. It's actually going to be a two part question. <laughs> and, then, and then just follow that up with, you know, what kind of um, what kind of career paths are graduates um, from the science concentration once they graduate from the J school where they uh, where they find themselves um, in the industry. Okay, um, I will. I will try to. I will endeavor to do that. Um, I'm very happy to be here, uh, as always happens in these these meetings uh, where we talk about the MA program, I feel like many of my colleagues do that I wish I could take each one of the different tracks. Um, <laughs> so it is always very exciting to hear about everything. Um, the science seminar is designed to help journalists who, uh, who don't necessarily have a background in science. In fact, most of our students do not have training in the sciences, but it is designed to help them still cover science deeply and with more nuance, a word that keeps coming up and context, another word that keeps coming up. Um, and sometimes people come here because they're very interested in a particular field and sometimes they're very interested in a particular issue. Uh, increasingly, that can be climate change and has been climate change for the last bunch of years. Um, and in the seminar, we look closely at the history and culture and practice of science. So we look at the journals, we look at the peer review system, we look at funding, we look at the lack of diversity and what that has meant and means for how science is practiced and what science gets done. It's a very sort of critical look at the culture of science. Um, we learn to take apart studies. And yet at the same time, we don't sort of uh, lose our sense of excitement and joy about uh, sciences and we try to get out into the field when we can. Uh, that was a little hard for the last couple of years, but I can report that this year we got out to a cemetery in Brooklyn and followed an urban ecologist and that was, it was great fun to be back out there and seeing science being conducted in the city in front of us, including all of the frustrations of field work that you might imagine happen in the city. Um, as in the other specializations, the seminar is a mix of guests, lecturers, uh, experts, and workshops that are just us, the students, and the journalism school professors, me in the fall, and Jonathan Wiener in the spring. Um, and through our guests, the students get glimpses into different fields, um, some major findings, some new frontiers, a sense of the history. And the idea is not that any of those glimpses are comprehensive in any way, um, but that there are ideas and patterns that come out of learning about AI or quantum physics or ecology that can be sort of applied across different fields so that you can see patterns like the incrementalism of science, um, how consensus is formed, um, how instruments shape discovery or limit discovery. Um, and this year uh, we had uh, experts come in from lichenology. We spent a lot of time talking about mushrooms as well, which was very, very exciting. 
Um, we had uh, historians of science, AI, I mentioned, climate scientists, um, urban ecologists, uh, and it's sort of very focused in the fall on technology, the physical sciences, and in the spring, we'll turn to neuroscience, to narrative medicine, to health, um, and it's more the life sciences and the biological sciences there. Um, a critical part of the seminar is, has come up with the other um, other uh, tracks is uh, the intense focus on writing. Um, we really focus on writing clearly, on narrative, on description, um, and because translating complex ideas is so critical to our work as science writers, um, we talk a lot about the critical importance of metaphor and understanding its historical and cultural baggage and um, how to be very aware about uh, just an incredible attention to language and to words. Um, and uh, really the aim of the seminar is to show that despite the way science is often portrayed or understood, it is not a part, it is not other. It is a fundamental habit of the human mind. It is accessible to everybody. And we train people to cover it that way um, as science and society, as, as human stories. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about the seminar. I'm delighted that Janelle is here to talk about it as well. Um, and so just very briefly, uh, people from the MA program, as, as Nick was saying, it's getting close to 20 years and people are all over the place and all different kinds of media and all over the world. Um, they're at the Washington Post, the Seattle Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. They're at Fox, Bay Nature, Wired, Science, Forbes, the Fuller Project, Popular Science. At the moment, Popular Science is extremely popular. There are four MA science grads who are working there. Um, we have people who are working in radio. Uh, we, one of our alums from many years ago is, is the new co-host for a science podcast called Shortwave on NPR. We have uh, a graduate from a few years ago who's doing a lot for free economics radio. We have people in documentary, advice. we have people writing books, you know. The best way to really see everything people are doing is to follow Ross's Twitter account. So, hope that wasn't too long. No, it's perfect. Thank you, Marguerite. Um, and Janelle, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, what was, what are some of the things that you learned in the science seminar um, that you're using um, at your current job? And tell us where you are now as well. Yeah, um, so, so much. Um, I am currently part of one of Columbia Journals and Investigations postgraduate research positions. So I'm working on the Global Migration Project, um, which was founded by the New Yorker's Sarah Stillman. Um, she does a lot of really in-depth coverage of migration and issues around that um, from like health to wage theft. Um, and uh, it's currently run by investigative journalist Kristen Lombardi. Um, who has covered things like um, the 9-11 toxic exposure. Um, and she was one of the first people to break what became the Boston Globe's um, coverage of the clergy. So I've got like this incredible position where I'm covering climate and migration, um, looking really in depth at the diff distinctions between uh, climate variation and climate change, which is something that like I did not have an understanding of prior to the MA science program. Um, as well as like healthcare disparities and how both of those two things, climate and health, impact different communities differently and especially the um, migrant population. So as I'm doing that, there have been like countless times talking to researchers and looking over studies where I have been very validated in my experience in, the, in Columbia's MA program. Um, looking at like the funding that's poured into studies and understanding the significance of that, being able to um, read studies with scrutiny to understand if the methodology is reliable, um, talking to scientists about um, modeling of different things like climate movement. Um, and, you know, one of the first things that happened like a week into this job was talking to a scientist um, and through that conversation, realizing that a very well-respected study on migration and modeling is not scientifically founded at all and having the scientific knowledge to understand 
why that is and um, be able to bring that back to my team and break that down for them so that we can move forward with confidence. Um, yeah, I just, I think one thing that Marguerite and Jonathan both bring to the table is like this passion for, for science and how it relates to our everyday lives and bringing it in from the other. And so, um, yeah, you do get like really deep conversations with scientists where you can pick their brains about the things that you don't understand, which is such incredible access to these brilliant minds, both within and outside of Columbia's um, different scientific fields, but um, also to kind of dwell on the poetry of science and science writing and the art of translation and breaking these really complex issues down into digestible tidbits that like you're excited about, you're excited about how to um, distinguish these things and, and make them relatable to someone who like maybe isn't interested in science or doesn't know they're interested in science. Um, and then I also just wanna add that um, the DART um, Institute at Columbia for my thesis, which touched on mental health impacts was so valuable and um, is just an example of a lot of the partner institutions that Columbia Journalism School has access to that can help sharpen um, and, and round out your experience as a journalist. Um, Bruce Shapiro definitely guided me a lot in terms of um, protecting myself as I covered traumatic um, traumatic topics, as well as making sure that I was being sensitive and caring as um, people I talked to revisited really, really traumatizing and, and challenging um, aspects of their lives. So um, there's so much more I could say, but yeah, I think the uh, science program has really helped me feel confident and ready to take on like a wide variety of topics from quantum physics, which I never understood before. And now I um, feel like I can interrogate at least um, <laughs> to like climate, healthcare, mental health, um, evolution. Um, and it's all like a really fun ride where you're talking through all these things and all the parts that um, yourself and your peers in the program don't get with some of the world's leading experts in these fields. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your experience at the J School. Thank um, you. Yeah, that will conclude the first um, half of our presentation. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Brett. Brett. Thank you, David. And thank you to everyone, all of our faculty members, our alumni, for sharing your insights, expertise, and experiences. For those of you in the audience, I hope you gained a better understanding of what you can accomplish here at Columbia, who you'll be learning from, and where you can take this after you leave because you are only a student for less than a year, but the career that that prepares you for can take you to places you probably have no idea you even want to go yet. And the, the faculty members who you heard from um, will, will help you get there. And um, whether it's in science or business or arts or politics, there's a route for you somewhere to take your career wherever you want it to go. And you heard from many different people who shared a lot of information. So I hope that generated some questions. So this is your chance now to ask those questions. We have about 10 minutes remaining. So um, Ross, do you want to open the chat? Do you want to allow people to raise their hands? I'll, I'll let you um, lay, down, lay down the rules for our Q&A. All right, thanks, Brett. So I think just for the ease of doing the Q&A, if you'd like to put uh, your question in the chat, I see someone has a hand up, but if you could please put your question in the chat and direct it to me, Ross Yelsey, I'm a co-host uh, for the session. You can just write in your question and I can try to moderate and ask as many um, that are uh, put there um, before our session wraps up. And then of course, we'll be able to have other sessions with our admissions team if you have questions we don't get to today. Well, great. I think the first question, I know um, Janelle and other people mentioned the master's thesis, which is this longer reported piece you get to do as MA students, and Jane talked about that too. I know in this discussion, we have a few people who were the advisee and the advisor for certain master's theses. Maybe faculty and students, if um, any of you would want to um, just shed a little bit of light on the process of developing that together. Anyone want to start with that? Well, while we're waiting, I can just um, give you some idea of what the process is. So um, I meet with all the MA students in September and uh, to talk about their ideas and their approach. And then in consultation with the faculty, 
we assign advisors by early October. Uh, and um, the advisors meet one on one with their advisees. Um, they are either from the MA faculty, from elsewhere in the journalism school, or from outside the journalism school for very specific topics. Um, and they tend to be um, journalists who, with whom we've worked closely in the past and have a lot of expertise in particular areas. Um, and then there's a lot of check-ins through the year. Um, as I mentioned, there are workshops. Um, Janelle talked about working with the DART Center. Uh, Bruce Shapiro is actually gonna be leading a workshop for the MA students on Friday. Um, we also have had workshops with Nick Lemon, with Jonathan Wiener, with a lot of different folks who uh, can talk about the techniques of doing a thesis as well as uh, as the subject matter. Um, the winter break is really the time for serious field reporting. And as I said, we do um, offer modest grants to students to support their field reporting. And in the last few years that I've been here, MA students have literally gone all over the world to do thesis reporting. Uh, and it, that's very, very exciting, I think, for us to be able to come back here and see those stories take shape. Mm -hmm. I could talk a little bit about you know, my experience with my advisees, if that would be helpful. Uh, working with my thesis advisees is one of the great satisfactions that I have as a, as a member of the faculty here. I work very closely with, with my advisees five a year. We meet uh, every week, every Friday, for a minimum of an hour for both terms. And we begin just brainstorming ideas. What are you interested in? What, what, a, what, you know, what might you want to write about? Then we try to find stories and stories that have enough layers of complexity and news value to hold up in, at eight or 10,000 words. And then the, the, we work out a reporting plan work up a reporting plan. And the writers go off and do all the reporting and writing on their own, of course, but they come back and bring the materials. We go over the materials together and organize it and end up uh, working on literally every word together. And we put the multiple drafts on screen and spend, day, <laughs> spend days actually working on literally every word. It's enormously satisfying. Uh, if you wanna see the product of this process, a student from last year named Alessandra Shad, Shade, forgive me. Uh, I, I was texting with her this 10 minutes ago. So I, 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 <laughs> forgive me, I mispronouncing her name. Uh, wrote a thesis on burlesque. And the entire piece was just published in the, in the Village Voice at full length, virtually verbatim. So if you want to see the, what a thesis was like when it was written, you could see it in print because it was published as it was written, Alexander Shade. A couple of other of our thesis have been very prominently published. One uh, uh, by a student named Abigail Jones was a cover story on Newsweek. Another was a cover story on Alta that won an award for reporting. So we've had high level of success with them. And it's just a very satisfying experience for uh, the writers and the advisees, I think. I can uh, speak from the point of view of the person who was advised. <laughs> so as, as you said, you know, students are going to get an uh, advisor assigned to them. I was uh, last year, I first of all, I should say that I came here, you know, with some experience of writing eight to 10,000 word stories. And I had my advisor, Nicholas Lehman, who I think still is here. So he can, you know, correct me wherever I am wrong on this. But it is a wonderful opportunity to be able to write something that long. You'll have to craft it from the beginning. You'll be reporting for two weeks. You will come back and write it. And, you know, through the year, I maybe had a dozen or more meetings with my advisor, Nick Lehman. And in the end, so, you know, in that you can talk about this is what I want to do with the story. This is not really working. You can say no to him if he advises something. It's sort of a negotiation of the sort that you would have with an editor at the magazine. And in the end, uh, you know, Nick Line edited every, the whole 10, 
about 11,000, 12,000 words that I wrote. So I think that's about as much attention as you can want from an editor. And it was a truly satisfying experience. And it's published or about to be published in New York Review, right, at all? It, yes, it will. It will. Uh, it's between edits, but they will publish it, yeah, at full length. So thank you. And, um, I should say that, um, you know, we send students all over the world to exotic places. Um, and uh, in Atul's case, coming from India, the exotic place was deep, deep rural Arkansas in the US, um, which is probably as exotic a place as you've ever been to, right? It was, it was quite an experience. I'd never reported in a place like that. It was an entirely, you know, exotic if you can call it that a completely alien atmosphere for me and i'd never been to the u.s before coming here so going to any part of the world or going to arkansas was you know it was about the same for me for some reason <laughs> great um and i know we're getting towards the end of our session so we'll have some more opportunities to have um check-ins with admissions and financial aid about those questions i'll put a link in for that but for now one thing we didn't really discuss we talked about the projects and kind of the curriculum what's it like to be a member of this ma community maybe our uh, recent alums and everyone could just maybe shed a little light on what it's like to be a part of this community i can jump in on that real quick um it is so encouraging to be part of the MA program. It's not competitive. Uh, I mean, everyone here is definitely a top achiever, but it's not that sort of cutthroat experience that you might think. Instead, everyone is truly legitimately rooting for one another, helping one another with their edits. Um, and it's, you know, it's been a community where we've been cheering each other on as we've gotten jobs, sharing one another's articles and are here for each other even after the program as well. We're, I think we're up to three marriages. <laughs> I mean, there's other things than that to get out of the program, but I'm just throwing that in there. As a, um, I would, I would, um, I would add to that that um, I think a lot of people in that have come through uh, our class have remarked on how important the presence of the other students has been to their experience. Mm -hmm. Because what is really neat about this program is. These are people who come from all over the world, uh, who have worked for several years, who have significant both life experience and, and journalistic experience, who are all coming together, who you might not think that somebody coming from Pakistan and someone from Brazil and someone from Finland would have stuff in common. But of course, they're all um, uh, bright, ambitious journalists who end up having a lot in common that um the cross-pollination that happens um is extraordinary i mean being in a class for example one year we had two iraqis um in the politics seminar one was a kurd and one was a sunni they had both lived through and reported on the u.s invasion of iraq <laughs> one for whom it was a war of liberation and the other for whom it was a catastrophe and to be able to in a respectful civil way talk about ethnic a conflict and civil war with people who really lived it. Um, you know, as a teacher, I feel like I learn an enormous amount. Everybody in the room learns and learns an enormous amount. The the, the students are a huge uh, part of the experience, not just the teachers. And if I could jump in there as well, it's not just the students and the faculty at Columbia. I feel like attending Columbia actually opens doors that I didn't even know existed. While I was studying there, I got the chance to work on an investigation with the New York Times, and I learned about that newsroom and how, how it operates. My thesis advisor helped me get part of my thesis published in the Times. But Columbia also connects you to other journalism organizations beyond just the school itself. So I've joined the Overseas Press Club and for the past four years, I've been on the board of the New York Financial Writers Association. And so I feel like the school helps propel you into other networks beyond just the campus. And I think that that can be invaluable for reporters because our network is just so important to our careers and where we, where we want to end up. So yeah, just to say Columbia opens um, opens doors beyond the school. Yeah, uh, I, I could just add. Um, oh, sorry, I'll 
<laughs> no, go ahead, Janelle, please. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I think that like for our group, we, we were 12 last year and um, the way that we like learned through each other's perspective of even how to ask questions was remarkable. Um, we had a, like part of our crew would do line edits before we submitted our um, our pieces to Marguerite and Jonathan, where we would get additional line ed edits from our professors. So it started this kind of collaboration and um, helping amongst us. And I've even since the program ended, um, continued being able to network through the help of colleagues, both within the science concentration and across the different MAs. And I've collaborated with um, one of my colleagues in the arts and culture concentration. And so it's not even just within the classroom of the seminar, but like throughout the different groups, you um, form friendships that I think are gonna be lifelong as well as um, really helping to boost each other, as Rosalind said, like it, it, it really is an encouraging environment where everyone's looking out for the best interest of each other. Great. Atul, did you want to add something? Uh, but just the same thing. It's it's that it's it's going to be a small knit community of people who are all going to care about the very same issues that you care about and they have covered these issues in different parts of the country and you will be reading each other's pieces you will be talking to each other about these pieces that you write the stories that you write and it's it's a great thing to be a part be part of and these are some of the people that you are going to truly cherish meeting i can assure you that <laughs> thank you Thank you. That's a great way to end the discussion. Thank you so much to our alums, uh, recent alums, and our faculty for shedding so much light on this program and you know why it's so special in the in the industry of journalism in terms of developing these really strong skills uh, for really you know ambitious uh, journalists. Um, so as uh, Brett mentioned in the chat, I saw that um, he put in the deadline for applications for this program. It'll be January six. So you have you know a bit over two months right now to uh, complete an application uh, for the MA program, and you can definitely check in with us uh, through the meet with us link that's in the chat about ways to uh, drop in uh, with admission staff to ask specific questions in multiple ways each week. And we'll also be having some other webinars for people who are interested in other degree programs you offer, including the MS in data journalism and the PhD in communications, which are coming up um, this weekend next. So you can register for those through that link as well if you have questions about them. But thank you again for this really um, informative session about the MA program. I hope you all have a great day and I uh, look forward to your questions.